Okay, I guess we're up now. All right. Okay, how you doing this morning? All right. All right, good. You had a good yeah. week? Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Well, I guess this morning's topic is about salvation. Uh, I'm glad this was one that we can get to discuss because I think that salvation or being saved is something that's misunderstood by a lot of uh, a lot of folks. Uh, I'll leave it to say that I misunderstood it for quite a while to get solid on what the Bible really says about it. And uh, that, you know, God has helped me to understand it because it's, it's actually, once we look at it, it's actually pretty simple, uh, but I guess you just have to see it uh, to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had talked a while back. It's like the, the question about when people say I've been saved, you know, or that I'm saved and I, 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 I ask the question now, were you saved from what and into what? Because the Greek word for saved, which is a verb, is to be rescued out of danger and put into safety. So it's like it's two parts to it. You just can't say that you've been rescued. You know, it's, it reminds me of uh, I mean, the, the original Star Wars where they were trying to rescue Princess Leia. But then they all got trapped. <laughs> See, so what, what, that wasn't a rescue. It's rescue right. out of the danger and then put into safety. So it's two parts to it. Mm, that makes so sense. That's, that's why I asked the question, well, what, have you, what are you saved from and what are you saved into? Yeah, right. it makes sense. Yeah, because, you know, like you said about Princess Leia, okay, we got you, we rescued you, now what? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. now we got to get out of here. Yeah. All right, we all in danger, yeah. So, so anyway, I thought a... a Good scripture to start off with was First Timothy two four, and to, to show that it is true that we are saved when we become a Christian. But there's something that more that God wants in reference to that. Yeah. See, so in that one, it says whose will it is, talking about God, that all sorts of right. people should be saved, there it is, and come into an accurate knowledge of truth. Right. So it, it, there's, becoming a Christian, yeah, you do actually get saved, but then there's a certain level of progress that God is going to push you, a, a Christian, towards. Mm -hmm. So that's important. So, what was your original thought of saved? I guess I should ask that. My original thought? Mm hmm Well, if you mean when I used to hear people saying it, yeah, it seemed kind of silly. Because, obviously, you're not done until you... You're not done until you die. And anything right. could happen between now and then. Um, which, that's kind of a... That, that's sort of a, a not complete thought, because... It is accurate that people are saved even before they die, but there are still pitfalls to be that could be fallen into. Mm -hmm. I guess the the thing I people talked about saved as if it was finished, like when they would say right. once saved, always saved. Right, right. You know, and that's not exactly true. Right. Yeah. See, so for a Christian, then we understand it's it's two salvations, and I guess I understood that too. It was. Once saved, always saved was not accurate, but the no. part that I was missing was the original salvation that comes, the first one. And it was always made out, as I, as I was growing up in religion, it was always made out that, you know, no, it's not once saved, always saved. But there was never any discussion on the first salvation. It was always the second salvation. Okay, is that mine? Okay, so camera device changed to <coughs> HD webcam. Okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. All right. Yeah, you disappeared for a second. Okay, yeah. All right, it came back. So the what's the original salvation? And and again, when people would say it, because, you know, a lot of church people say, I'm saved. So what's the original salvation, and what are you saved from and into what? So that's the thing that I took to understanding. So... If you ask a person, well, what do you say from, they're going to say sin. And I think that's a, it's a simple answer, but it doesn't explain what that means. Or what are you saved into 
or how are you saved from sin? It doesn't. And what's the evidence then that you're saved from sin? Because I always thought, as the scripture said, wages the sin pays is death, and you still die. So you're not actually saved from sin because it still has an effect on your body, right? And it still has effect around you. So uh, I think Jesus' words, in terms when he's talking to Nicodemus, explains yep. with the issue at hand from what we're saved from. So he said to Nicodemus in, in uh, was it 336? Uh, John 336? Sounds right. Let's see. Um, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, and he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Yeah. See, so I, I think that's the, the issue that Jesus was showing. Because remember, later on, and even, even throughout chapter 3, but then later on, I want to say in chapters 5 and 6, especially chapters five, chapter 5, Jesus yeah. discusses the eternal life, that one who believes the son has eternal life or, or everlasting life. We'll... That the word everlasting we'll get into later, you know, that'd be another discussion. Right. But yet yeah, he's he's explaining that in chapter five, that when you believe in him, when you believe the son or have faith in the son, you have. He said it's current. When you believe in the son, then you have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't saying that that's something future. He was telling, well, he did say it was something future also, but he was saying right then and there, you have life. But then again, the contrast is remaining un under the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. So I think that clarifies. People say sin. Yes, we say from sin, but Jesus clarified it as being the wrath of God, which people are under. And then if you're saved, then you're saved from the wrath of God. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and well, interesting that it talks about having knowledge, and I'm not sure if it's the same Greek word, but I know John seventeen three was one we knew for a long time about taking in knowledge of God uh -huh. and Christ. What it actually says in Greek is knowing God and yeah, Christ. That's right. That's right. And so it's the difference between like looking up a Wikipedia page about somebody and actually knowing that person as a friend. Exactly. That's right. So, so, and then, so that goes back to the personal relationship from God. I think my screen right. froze. Uh, hopefully you can still, it's still recording me. My screen froze for a second. It looks like it's it not says, moving. It says it's recording. You see, no, it, it still is. Can you see me moving? I all? see you moving. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's frozen on here. All right. That's good. All right. So, <laughs> so then to be saved then, and then rescued, we're rescued out of the danger of the wrath of God. That's the, I think that's the first thing to say that we, that's what we've been saved from. Mm -hmm. And to understand it is Romans 1, 18 through 32, where Paul is saying that the wrath of God is being revealed now. It's already in being revealed. So I think that no one really gets into that portion of it to understand that there's two wraths of God. There's the original wrath of God that is now, and then there's the wrath that is coming. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with the salvation now, then the salvation that comes. But right now we're saved from a revealed wrath. It's, it's actually showing. And Paul talked about that, about <coughs> God giving up on men as they progress in uh, further depravity or uh, further... Uh, Romans 1, They're right? Mine. Yeah, Romans 1, exactly. Yeah. So when it, it God talks about, or excuse me, the Bible talks about that, it, it's, it's saying that uh, for the wrath of God, this is verse 18, is being revealed, so it's current, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who are suppressing the truth in an unrighteous way. So when people don't know or they... Maybe they do know and they fight against the mm -hmm. righteous principles of God, the righteousness of God. When they don't know what that is, fight against it. Well, then they bring about God's wrath. And then it talks about 
that people become empty headed in their reasoning in 21. How's it reading your verse in verse 21? That's Romans one. Romans one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So King James says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Yeah. So that is actually the wrath. That's part of the wrath of God. And then it says, although they were claiming they were wise, they became foolish and turned the glory of the incorruptible God into something like the image of a corruptible man and birds and four-footed creatures and reptiles. So it says, therefore, God, in keeping with the desires of their heart, gave them up to uncleanness that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Mm -hmm. So there's a start right there. The God gives them up. Where, so he removes his protection from them mentally, and then they can get into things of, the, uh, of dishonoring their bodies. You know, mm -hmm. so they got now they got a depraved mind and now right. they have to suffer consequences that come along with the depraved mind. And then it further 26, God gave them up to their uncontrolled sexual desires. So there's another stage of God. Now, I'm going to keep letting it loose. The, the further you get away from me and, and my principles, then yeah. it suffers further. And then down in verse 28, it talks about God giving them up even further. So that's the wrath of God. And. Like the scripture says, if these men are suppressing truth or reality in an unrighteous way. And I think we see that nowadays. It's always when these these lifestyles are being promoted, there's never a discussion of the reality of the lifestyle. They try to put it up always as something good. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, I, just, I was just thinking about that, you know, there was a I was listening to a lady, I can't remember her name, but she was talking about the, with, with children especially, but she was talking about the real statistics behind transgenderism and how frequently <coughs> just on their own people commit suicide. Oh, really? Yes. It's, 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 the numbers are pretty high. And, that, and I, I really feel bad for them, especially when they're children. And then they're the parents are forced to give them up to let them, you know, cut off their genitalia to say, OK, well, I'm 11, 12 years old, but I want to be a boy or a girl. I want to be able to choose. Well, those kids have problems later on down the road. Wow. See, so again, and I'm just just simply as an example is that no one really puts forth, especially in, in the news and the media, the reality of these types of lifestyles. <laughs> Uh, is same same thing with with the you know for the time that I grew up the gangster rap that type of stuff mm -hmm. you know they were talking about certain things in their life but then there was a reality of their life and suicide is in the the uh, mid to late nineties suicide among young black men was pretty high oh really you know, in those oh yeah it it was pretty high it, it was because they were feeling lost. See, no one talks about all of those things. So there, it goes back to that scripture that they're suppressing reality in an unrighteous way. They're not telling the reality of life. And so it, yeah. they may glorify a certain lifestyle, but then there's a reality behind it that keeps being suppressed. And Yeah, and they did do that with gangster rap. That's true. Exactly. Yeah. All, all of these lifestyles that are really put in defiance of God's law, mm -hmm. uh, defiance of godly principles. Those lifestyles have consequences, and those things are being suppressed. And yeah. but and and that's so we just talk about the reality of those things. That's what we are being saved from as Christians. Yeah, that's what you know, we're rescued. Yeah, yeah. And one uh, phrase that I hear not so much anymore, but a couple of years ago, it seems like that really infuriated me was when people talk about my truth, or yes, your truth or his truth. And it's like. So as opposed to the truth. So really, they can't even really justify what they're doing. So they have to call it my truth as if it's true for me, maybe not necessarily for you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what I would 
what I would like to say, okay, well, if you're going to talk about your truth, then let's talk about the consequences of, let's talk about the truth of your consequences too. <laughs> so what is that? Just stick with me for, for five years. And I want to know how you feel in five years later. Now tell me the truth. Right. You know? When you're turning tricks for drugs on the street. Exactly. See, so it's what happens to a lot of them. It is. It really is. Yeah. So it, it's hard because you can talk about your truth, but someone has to fund that lifestyle. <clears throat> but then there's also mental and emotional consequences that come along with it. Yeah. You know? So there's a, the difficulty of things that are, are not being discussed. But in the end, that's what we're being saved from. That's what it's saying. We're yeah. saved from God's yeah. wrath. And I've mentioned this before, but... Um... If you remember, there's a scene in the movie Silence of the Lambs when they're talking about the killer, Buffalo Bill. Uh huh. And Hannibal Lecter mentions that uh, there are only two at the time in the late, early 90s, whatever, late 80s. There were only a couple universities or a couple hospitals that did uh, gender reassignment surgery. Uh huh. And that when you went in, you had to do an extensive psychological examination first because they had to determine that this is really you. You really wanted to become. The opposite gender mm -hmm. so he told he tells clarice so what you're looking for is somebody who took that fit that psych exam and failed okay he said no you're not really going to want to be a woman okay now, i thought about that because in that movie i guess they couldn't make that scene now because uh, well maybe they still do those but if they do and you fail do you then go whoa you're just you're just uh denying my truth right exactly uh, that's what that's what it would be i think you know yeah yeah, do, do they even have that psychological exam anymore? They might not. Well, not no, yeah. well, I guess they couldn't because if they're, if they're allowing, you know, prepubescent teens to make these decisions, you know, that and, and the parents can't stop it. So, so the parents yeah. don't have to sign off on it? They just do it? No, they're forced, yeah. Oh, they, they've been forced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, now, there are some parents who will agree to it, but again, there it is to not have the wisdom to mm -hmm. say, no, this isn't good to know what's missing. Like I was saying last week, maybe it's a spiritual thing they're missing. Mm -hmm. It probably is a spiritual component that they're missing that they need to be injected with so that they can get the balance. But anyway. Well, and in my psych counseling training, I have learned that um, disassociative gender disorder it is a real thing, and it happens with children as young as five. And I, I think I may have actually had it myself at one point it's something that most kids grow out of mm -hmm. you know because i can remember a time when i liked playing with girls i like playing with dolls and you know girls toys and whatnot but it's something you grow out of eventually if you're left alone to figure it out okay. but they're not doing that now they're seeing a five-year-old boy play with dolls and an easy bake oven and going oh he must actually be a girl oh okay yeah yeah see yeah. no that's just that's funny that you say that because i can remember being young and my sister had dolls and I played with her dolls, but it was always, they got into a fight and then, you know, cause wrestling was on back then. So then the, oh, then the girls yeah. would be wrestling, you know, like one be picking up over the head and body slamming. So it, was, it always right. turned violent. But of course I'm what, five, six years old. That's what boys do. <laughs> so, right. And so my niece but, did the same thing. So there okay. you go. She was experimenting with being a boy, but okay. Okay. You know, she didn't stay that way. Right. So, you know, it, it's just funny. That's, that's actually pretty funny. Uh, that, that now how they have shifted things. But again, the, the point I'm making with that is that with all of these lifestyles, you know, the transgender, just one, I was mentioning the, uh, the violent lifestyle that comes with the, the whole gangster rap culture and things. And that that's just another, but this is what a Christian is saved from in terms of the wrath of God. That's what the Bible is explaining. So we're just giving it some examples of how the wrath of God now comes upon people. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are saved from. Now, very much in the same way it was on Pharaoh, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Where God poured out His wrath, and that's in that way. With him. Yeah. Now, here, here's the thing: is what are we saved into? And and then there should be evidence that there's a salvation there. So you saved out of one and saved into another. Well. If you go to Romans 5, it, it helps to identify this discussion, uh, his, Paul's full discussion from chapter 1 of what he was saying, because he was talking about salvation. But in chapter 5, he's letting us know what we've been saved into. And so, you know, this one may not say it, this 
version may not say it. How does uh? Let's see what verse am I looking at? Yeah, how how does one and two read? Romans okay. five. Uh-huh. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, so uh, this is that's more common, but if for me, I, I had only heard it from a from a movie, but. In Christendom, okay. there's a term that comes from this verse called the state of grace. Ah, yeah. And I'd only heard that from a movie, the term state of grace. I, I didn't know what it was, but state of grace is actually verse two, this this grace which we now stand. So Paul mm -hmm. was saying that we have been saved from the wrath of God into the state of grace. Mm -hmm. And so the, the state <clears throat> of grace is what we have been rescued for, rescued into. That's the safety that we have because now we enjoy peace with God through Christ mm -hmm. because we become Christians. Now we're in a state of peace with him instead of a state of enmity, which brings about his wrath because of sin. We've been washed of sin and now declared righteous or justified as that scripture says. Now we can enter into the state of grace, which is now a condition in terms of our relationship with God to where God can now bestow upon us the blessings that would come with a man who doesn't sin. All right. So in verses three and four, it says, uh, or three through five, rather, it says, not only that, but let us rejoice while in tribulation, since we know that tribulation produces <clears throat> endurance. Endurance in turn produces an approved condition. The approved condition in turn hope. And the hope does not lead to disappointment because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has, uh, which was given to us. So now there's a, an interesting thing to have God's love poured into our hearts. So then it's not something where we would constantly need God to remind us of his love because he's pouring it out into our hearts so mm -hmm. that we know that we're loved by him. We have that personal relationship with him through Christ. And so now God pours this love out into our heart. So, and here's the other point, just real quick. Titus 2 tells us the uh, the other effects of the state of grace. Do me a favor because I, I, I like how it may read better in uh, in King James. Would you read 11 through 14? Okay. Okay. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purity for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. See, so... There it tells us the effects of being in the state of grace. Mm -hmm. See, so God's love is poured out into our hearts. Then it says down, so what it does, then we get taught or trained on, on how to live, to reject ungodliness and worldly desires, and to have a sound mind amidst this present age. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. See, so so you, you see that then there should be a definite distinction between mm -hmm. a person who is in the state of grace and a person who's under God's wrath. That's what we're in. So that's what's being saved. You should see a person being, who's saved because they would give evidence by their life. Uh, wisdom is something else that, that they would be able to draw upon and they would develop in their own life is godly wisdom mm. because they've learned to reject all these things that, as it says, and to live a certain way. So they would develop godly wisdom. Right. So, so I think that's part of understanding the, the part of the Bible and the statements that people make while I've been saved. Well, let me see the evidence. You should know what you saved from and you should know what you're being saved into. And there should be evidence by your state of mind and then the results of your life that you're in this state of grace. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see it. See, so just saying that you're saved, that's fine. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to disparage anyone's 
own belief. But I think a lot of times it's just the influence of the religion as opposed to their actually having knowledge. Because it does say be saved and come into an accurate knowledge. That's what he wants. Yeah. So you should, we should then know. Yeah, something happened this week with a singer of a Christian rock band um, called Hawk Nelson. I don't remember the guy's name, but um, the point is, and he uh, decided that he no longer believes in God. And he okay. put it out on Instagram. Wow. Now, the thing about you know Christian rock, Christy likes it. I, I have a problem with it because it just seems so sterile to me. Uh huh. And the lyrics are, you know, it's like they're they don't talk at all about the troubles they're going through. They just always sing about Jesus, how great he is. And a lot of them are like love songs, and they took the word baby out <laughs> and the name put Jesus in. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so this guy has an eight page uh post on Instagram about why he doesn't believe in God anymore. And I read it. And for the first couple pages, you know what he talks about is his doubts began when he was a kid in church. Wow. And okay. it was, and he mentions, you know, but everybody around me loved Jesus and believed in Jesus and was getting baptized. And so I did it too. So when I read that, the first thing I thought is, okay, first of all, you don't really know that. You don't know that everybody around you truly loved Jesus and mm -hmm. wanted to be baptized, they might all just been doing it because you did it, you know, because everybody else is doing it just like you did. Right. So, um, I, I don't want to say that anybody who's in a church is not a true Christian, but I have a hard time believing that you have a church and everybody in there is a true Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because going by the wheat and the weeds parable, there's got to be some weeds in there. Right. Well, well and, and again, even in terms of a, a true Christian is is we can see certain things with people, mm -hmm. and that would that would cause us to question the state of their Christianity, their relationship with God. Right. Yes, and, yeah. Je and Jesus said when he was talking in Matthew chapter uh, twenty four near the end, and especially twenty five, he says, "Oh yeah, I'm going to judge, <laughs> you know, all of my folks." Uh, yeah. In the end, so, so so that's the second salvation that we're talking about. The, the Jesus people, all those who claim to be Christian, have to go through. A judgment. It starts with the so-called Christians, but again, people can hoop and holler about how much they love Jesus and love God. Mm -hmm. But when you look at their life, see, and that's that's the thing about it is even when I was, you know, in religion, sometimes people's physical bodies gave off evidence that yeah, I don't see God's blessing on you. I just don't. See it. Then I look at your family situation. I'm not seeing too much of God's <clears throat> blessing on you, but yet you claim to be a Christian. And I think that's what happens, as we discussed last week, about the influence of the religion. It gets in the way of that freedom, and I think it hinders the free flow of God's spirit upon a person because now you got to do it through the religion. And, and mm -hmm. that's what Paul was saying. You go back, he was telling them in Galatians, you go back to the Mosaic law and get circumcised. Now you got to practice the whole law. Well, Christ is no good for you. So when you mm -hmm. get in religion and you really get into it, you can be, it's possible that people can get into a state to where Christ is no good for them. All right. And now they're back under God's wrath. Even though they are in a religion that's so-called Christian, they're back under God's wrath. Out of ignorance, not, not purposeful, but they're back under God's wrath because they've allowed this religion to tell them who God and Christ is, not themselves. Not mm -hmm. looking at the Bible for themselves, getting direction from Christ and trusting that God is going to bless us for our obedience just by listening to Christ so yeah. that, you know, you don't take the religion serious. So that's what I, I think happens, you know, because I saw that, too. I saw a lot of that, you know, uh, where the lifestyles that people led didn't give evidence of being in a state of grace. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, another, I think another good scripture where it it talks about being under the wrath of God and giving a comparison was Ephesians 4, uh, 17 through 19. We don't have to read it all, but it was just talking about people being in darkness mentally and the futility of people's minds. Mm -hmm. And then he contrasted that why, about having a new mental disposition and a new personality that was created according to God's will in true righteousness and loyalty. So there again was a contrast. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 Again, shows the contrast of being of under flesh. God's wrath, yeah, yeah, and then the fruits of the spirit. See, so, so all throughout the scriptures, it talks about if we're looking at it 
from that context of what salvation is, it's talking about the contrast, being under God's wrath, mm -hmm. being in the state of grace. And if we just look at a lot of Paul's writings from there, it tells us. So Paul could say to the Corinthians, what do you not know that unrighteous people will not inherit God's kingdom? How do you not know this? God should have trained you because you're in the state of grace. Mm -hmm. You know, So maybe there's something that you're missing because I'm quite confident that, you know, God and Christ would give you that knowledge and that understanding of matters without them being written down because, you know, God's law is written on your heart. So you would get an instinctive understanding of it. You know, so maybe there's something that we're fighting against. That's the way I kind of make it out. Uh, once I looked at it from that light from of salvation mm -hmm. is the state of grace that we enter into as opposed to the contrast of God's wrath and its results. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, so that now, especially now when I read and look at the term salvation, you talk about the current salvation, but then just so that we, we get it, that there is a future salvation too. Right. For Christians. And that's something that we don't have to worry about if we are saved currently and then we're growing and developing in the state of grace, well, the future salvation would be assured, you know, and, and Jesus mm -hmm. talked about that too. in in John chapter five, he was talking about the future salvation along with the current salvation. It just isn't made clear, but I think what happened, he didn't have to do that for the Jews because the Jews, when you look at it, there are so many times that the term salvation is mentioned in the old Testament. I mean, all throughout Psalms, especially, it talks about salvation. So, and Jesus said later, salvation originates with the Jews. So he, mm -hmm. the Jews understood that there were two salvations, but the Greeks didn't understand that. So Paul right. had to now explain it to them that, no, there's two salvations that Christ is offering. There's one now, and then mm -hmm. there's one in the future. But I think, uh, let's see, what is that? First <clears throat> Thessalonians... Yeah, well, well, let's let's go first with yeah, First Thessalonians five. Okay. First Thessalonians five. Yeah, eight and nine. Got it. Okay, so now uh, it it says, uh, but as for us who belong to the day, let us keep our senses and put on the breastplate of faith and love and hope of salvation as a helmet because God assigned us not to wrath, but to acquire salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in that verse, that's one of the verses where it's talking about the future salvation. But it, uh -huh. but here again, it talks about the future wrath that's coming too. So it's not only the current wrath, but the a future wrath. And then in First Peter, I made a note of that. Where was that? First Peter 1, 5. First Peter one five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Go ahead and jump to First Peter one five. I'm going to read Hebrews nine twenty eight. Okay. First Peter one five. Got it. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and read that one? Um. So it starts with who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay. So again, there's talking about the future salvation. And then mm -hmm. in 928 of Hebrews, it says, so also the time to bear the sins of many and a second time that he appears will be apart from sin and he will be seen by those earnestly looking for him for their salvation. So mm -hmm. there's that future salvation. And that one seems to be more of a salvation in a physical sense where we're, we're saved from the current age. And and then the Christians are taken to heaven uh, mm -hmm. to be with Christ. So that's more of a physical salvation. We were saved out of one thing into something else, but it's physical as opposed to simply a spiritual. I'm going to say simply, but as opposed to the spiritual salvation that we, that we receive when we become Christians. Yeah. So so there again, and and I want to just to make the, this other point that there are two salvations. There's also two wraths of God in First Thessalonians one ten. Okay. So, so there are other scriptures, but I just want to mention this one just to show that Paul was also talking about a future wrath 
in Romans, but here in 110 it says, and to wait for the Son of God from heavens, whom he raised up from the dead, namely Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Mm -hmm. See, so there's, a, again, talk about a future wrath of God right. that's coming. So, so in those, I think that's pretty much a good explanation of salvation and being saved. We, we have to focus more so on the salvation that we, we receive as Christians and then give evidence that we have been put in the state of grace to where we receive God's blessing. And it has an effect. So there should be evidence that people can see about us and our lifestyle that we're in the state of grace. Yeah. And I took a minute here to look up uh, when I was mentioning about this means everlasting life in uh, John 17, 3. Mm -hmm. Because the Greek word zoe, which is translated life, it doesn't just mean physically living forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a quality of life. Yeah, that's the term, isn't it? Yeah. See, now, now, which again brings to another discussion. I think we've had this one before, but when you see what, again, looking at things from the context of what Jesus was saying, he's talking about a quality of life as compared to a separate quality of life. Same thing Paul was saying, state of grace and that quality of life, being under God's wrath, and then that quality of life. So yeah. when when I was in when I was in religion, there was a scripture that we use commonly that I misunderstood until later. To understand that Jesus was not talking about life and death, he was talking about a quality of life, uh, two qualities of life. Matthew seven thirteen, the two roads. This was one that we use often, especially in in Jehovah's Witness circles. We used that it says go in through the narrow gate because broad is the gate, uh, and spacious is the road leading to destruction. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and and many are going through it whereas narrow is the gate and cramped is the road leading off into life and few are finding it so there's the, the two roads that he's talking about leading to two different things he's not talking about destruction where you're completely destroyed the, there's right. actually two or roads to destroy yeah. yeah exactly he's talking about a quality of life that you're living where there's one in the state of grace then there's mm -hmm. the other one where it's a destroyed life or a ruined life. That's what the right. destruction is. So the two Greek words for destroy and destruction, and the Greek word that he used here in Matthew seven thirteen, is not talking about complete annihilation. It's talking about a ruined life. Mm -hmm. That's what it's talking about. So most of the scriptures, when it terms the term destruction, is talking about a ruined life. Not talking about complete destruction or annihilation of your life. Right. So when once that gets set in your mind, now you can see more clearly about what being saved is, what the salvation is. You should have a different life. And in fact, mostly in the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, they had a word for people who are living that destructive kind of life or that destroyed life. Remember, they called them good for nothing men. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. So when you, yeah, that's you still, we still have good for nothing men now. You can see them. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? That's uh, another point to make on that. That's, that's actually good because you jogged my memory with uh, Naboth and Abigail. Even though he was wealthy, he still was good for nothing. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, so his life was destroyed. And then God brought a situation upon him because he was so bad. God brought a situation upon him. To where uh, I guess he had a heart attack, you know, but, but it did. It actually Here's said, so, yeah, I, it actually said in the scriptures that God was determined to put him to death. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's what it said. I think it was regarding him, man. Let me not say it was definite, but th that's the thing that God is loves life that he gives to people so much that he's not trying to kill you off, mm -hmm. he's trying to help you to see that you can have a better life. Yeah. Especially under him, and <clears throat> being in a religion that wants a genocide, that was hoping for the genocide of the entire, just about the entire race of mankind, except for those in the religion. I think a lot of religions believe that that yeah. so many people will be genocide, and they believe that about God, that God was looking to genocide people when that's not the case. 
whether they really think about it or not, because, um, you know, obviously I was in the same religion and I didn't think too hard about it. Right. I just kind of assumed, I guess I just kind of assumed, well, most of these people will probably be okay. Right. You know? right. <laughs> yeah, but now we know. It's like, no, that, yeah. you, you look, just looking at the Greek terms for destruction, <clears throat> well, God wasn't trying to destroy people. No. He was trying to save people. That's what Jesus said. I came to judge the world. I came to save it. Yeah, and in fact, yeah. in Second Peter 3, 9, when it says, you know, God desires... Every, how does it say? Exactly? Yeah. Now, now again, Second Peter is a good example of the contrast of the two destructions. Well, oh, we yeah. just have to look at it. You know, according to to, to what it says in Greek, I, I wish I wish it was better explained. But uh, like <clears throat> they would use the word perdition, but I think perdition is still talking about destruction. Perdition. And, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Oh, okay, yeah. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right. Now, here's a funny thing. In that verse, when, when you look at it in context, mm -hmm. that verse is actually talking about complete annihilation. Yeah, yes, it is. But in terms of context of time, verse 7 says, but, but by the same word, the heavens. And the earth that now exists are reserved for fire and are being kept until the day of judgment and of destruction of the ungodly people mm -hmm. in verse seven. But that destruction is the ruined life. So what God is what is saying is that upon Christ's return, <clears throat> the separation of the sheep and the goats, the goats go into a punishment and the, the the greek word for punishment there is punishment with the view of correction so mm -hmm. it's not that they are destroyed annihilated no they are destroyed and or in other words christ brings to bear the wrath of god on them so now they see clearly the footage of their life mm -hmm. and now they have faced ruination in front of christ that judgment and that ruination and now they're under a term of correction you know, so right. maybe they can be rehabilitated. <laughs> and then that's what it's saying in verse seven, that they are destroyed based their, on their life. Then now they see the ruination of their life from that judgment. And then in verse nine, it says that God is patient because he does not want people to be annihilated. So I don't want you to continue under this punishment <clears throat> and correction to where you get worse. Now I have to annihilate you completely. No, I want you to repent. Yeah. So even the the ones who are the goats still get an opportunity to repent, but they have to be brought to the consequences of their lifestyle and choices has to be brought to bear upon them so that they have the opportunity to repent. So that yeah. for me, that's, um, that's a loving God that does that. Right. And I was thinking, too, in the con thinking of the context of fire. The Greeks would have known this as well as the the Hebrews, because anybody after the anybody after the Iron Age would know this that fire is not just destructive; it is also cleansing. Yep. That with certain elements, it um, purges be refined. the exactly. bad, yeah, mm -hmm. and keeps the good. Yeah. And for that matter, if if fire destroys one person completely, if they were just nothing but bad, then probably being destroyed was the best thing that ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and us. <laughs> For the yeah. person to be destroyed. But yeah, you're right. So there's a refining fire and there's a <coughs> destructive fire. And mostly God is talking about the refining. Yeah. Because he does not want people to be destroyed, completely annihilated. So that's why I'm, I'm glad uh, to understand that better about salvation. When people, religion has made God to be this vengeful God. And it's not what he is at all. He's not yeah. vengeful. You know, his, he is he's a loving God who really wants people to repent, change, adjust to live a quality of life that is a high quality <clears throat> to where they're the benefit to themselves and to others. Yeah. When people look at the old Testament, they would say, you know, God is bloodthirsty and mm -hmm. destructive, you know, but if you really look at how long it took him to finally put the Canaanites to death, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, it was several Several generations. He gave them hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. That's why he told them four hundred years for the Amorites 
you know, for yeah. their era to be complete. So you think of the number of generations that had passed and to continue into that type of traumatic uh, religion. And mm -hmm. then this generation has an effect. These, at a certain point, they had hardened hearts where it's like, well, it's, these hearts are not going to change for the most of them. You know, the, nothing give you a nice left. kid. That's right. Nothing good left. Nothing so, left to refine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, <clears throat> so that's really shameful that God has been made out to be that type of person without the understanding mm -hmm. of who he really is. But yeah, no, he doesn't, you know, he gives you, he, he wants time. That's why it says too, again, in, in verse eight, that, you know, a day is like a thousand years. So God does not have to eliminate people because if they were allowed to live longer, perhaps they could refine themselves. They can accept the discipline, repent, and then yeah. move on to a better life. Some people may just be <laughs> super hardened and they don't want to change. But God has to, or not because they don't have to, he wants to give people those opportunities. Right. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, when we used to say most of the world is wicked, most of the world's broken. Yeah. You know, right. And if, if they had the opportunity, if they could be fixed and if they could be allowed to get rid of this, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the stuff going on in their heads, then they might, they'd be okay. Right. Exactly. And they could start to heal and actually become good, productive people. Exactly. See, so it goes back to men who are suppressing reality mm -hmm. in an unrighteous way because <clears throat> they want a general effect on people. <clears throat> and that effect is not for them to be godly people, to live by godly principles uh, to understand Jesus Christ. No, they don't want that. They want people to become violent and and empty headed, you know, to go on in these lifestyles that really bring about a ruination of their life. That's what yeah. they want. See, so there, there's a lot of suppression of reality. And especially in this time, for a person who really wants a high quality of life, we actually need Christ, you know, his words. And that's, that should be like another, we, we got to get back to that discussion on, you know, what a Christian actually is, but it yeah. really is, is that we need God, Christ and us and get everything else out the way so that we can live a high quality of life, which God wants us to live. <clears throat> so, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, it's a really good dis discussion on what salvation and all its results would mm -hmm. be, you know, I, I'm so glad to take religion out of it and, and those beliefs. Yeah. See, once that gets out of you and Christ can get right to us and our hearts and our understanding. Right. You know, and, a, a lot and a, right. And a big thing I think for anybody is to, you know, look at the Bible and just read it without, without putting, without any expectation. Yeah. I know that's no what I judgment. started doing. Yeah, that's what I started doing was just let me just open the Bible and pretend I've never seen it or heard of anything about it. And let's see what I get from it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when cause I, I would read the Bible daily, but I had all these preconceived ideas. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's a bunch of scriptures <clears throat> that I could read and pass right by without any thought. Well, again, religion is affecting what you see and you don't notice that till you get out of it. You know, yeah. so Absolutely. Yeah, see, so, but I started with the premise of believing that the Bible was the word of God. And when it said that God is the God of love, you know, that God is love, I started from that premise. So, no, there has to be then, if Jesus said that if you, you've seen the Father, you've seen me, then there has to be the evidence of God's love in there. Now, once you take out the genocide and destruction, annihilation of humans, you mm -hmm. take that off the table. That that's what God wants to do again. You take that yeah. off the table, and then you start looking at the words <clears throat> that are spoken. You start looking at them in Greek. You say, "Oh, yeah, I can see why God doesn't want to kill people." And you see why it says He regretted having to do it back in the time of Noah. But people were so bad that that tells you how bad they were. Yeah, and He still didn't want to, but He knew He had to. He had to start it over because of the the influence of of the devil and the the. Uh, angels, the demonic angels, people had just gotten so bad so fast. Whereas yeah, they did you know, along with sin. But nowadays he doesn't want to do that again. He said, I'm not going to do that again. You know? Yeah. So it wasn't just that he was saying, I'm not going to destroy it by flood only. It's like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take out the entire race. 
Right. I'm going to yeah, rebuild it and, and let them grow, and I, I've got a way to correct it. Yeah. Yeah, because what would be the point of having to do all that again? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How about how about <clears throat> just slowing it down, putting parameters in place to slow down the effects until Christ can come, and then now he has his message on how people can improve. And I think that many, many, many people have. They've sought it, but they just don't get that they're just not spoken of. They sought to live according to the way Christ said and, mm-hmm. and were blessed from it. But they're, these are not publicized people. These are just probably everyday people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could also be some of the persecuted uh, yeah, throughout exactly. history mm-hmm. where the church or, you know, when Especially I say the church, I mean the, the, the religious organization. Yeah, <laughs> right. Where they are persecuted by the religious organization. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so and, and there were more than just ju- the the few who are named, or probably many who were persecuted for just trying to live according to the Bible. Because even in even in a, the Roman Catholic Church, suppressed the scriptures themselves. They didn't want the scriptures in the common languages of the people. They right. weren't translated. See, so and that was that was a power move. They didn't want people understanding this for them, themselves, making an effort because people would. And then the church would lose its influence. So that was just power. They, that, that was money they would lose because now people would start to, okay, well, now I'm going to read what Christ says and live that way. It had nothing to do with the church. Yeah, I think there was a quote about that at uh, the Diet of Worms that the Catholic uh, cardinals said to Martin Luther because he wanted to create a, you know, he did create a Bible in German so mm-hmm. the common people of Germany and the German-speaking countries could read it. And he said, you know, why don't we allow everybody to understand this? And the response from the Cardinals was, well, if everybody um, does what they want according to their own consciences, well, we'd have chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they love that order and control. <laughs> yeah, they don't want people to live by their consciences, and they that's actually right. basically, they told him that. Yeah, and that's pretty revealing. But I think that's how all religions are. All religions want control of your life. And so mm-hmm. governments, there's so many people who want control. They want that power to influence. So, I mean, just think about it. If people lived by <laughs> Jesus' teachings, mm-hmm. there would not be chaos. There would be a breakdown of the controls on society. So those yeah. controls would lose their influence because mm-hmm. now people are living. And there wouldn't be chaos. There, there would be a lot of wisdom, a lot of development. A lot of different things. It'd be a totally different world if people lived according to Christ's teachings. There'd still be nations. <clears throat> you can still have your country or whatever the case may be, but there would be far less control and far more freedom. Yeah, they'd look much, very different. Yeah, exactly. Countries would, yeah. Exactly. So I, I think, you know, living in the United States, uh, there's a bunch of levers of control. But yeah. one thing that is mentioned from the Constitution and that gets influence in people's lives is liberty. And freedom. So even when you look in the scriptures, you start to see that the terms liberty and freedom are used. Now, there's no no connection with the Constitution. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the word itself, where people begin to think about what it means to be free. And the scriptures talk about a Christian being free. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, so when you search for that freedom, the Christian freedom, when you search for that, and then you can actually find it, you see it is really liberating. And the control measures that have been put in place, even in this country with the school system, the religions, all of those things. No, you can break from those things and have your own freedom to develop. Right. See, and it's, a per- again, personal relationship with God <clears throat> through Christ. There's a lot of freedom there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, of course, there's a lot of people that want to be told what to do, too. Ex- well, yeah, that's the flip side. And that's you know. probably from the generations of holding that kind of control. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, just being able to break free from that. But yeah, I, I do. You do notice that with people, they want rules. You know, they yeah. want their own. They, they Well, they want someone to give them guidelines other than Christ, because Christ actually does give you guidelines. It right. Gives you well, rules, you know? like even <laughs> even during the quarantine, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, why don't they just have the army make everybody stay in their homes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's like, really? Yeah. You'd want that? Exactly. They don't think about that. Well, why aren't you wearing your mask? Because I'm free not to. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So then if they're going to say, well, you're going to get the coronavirus, well, then it's the consequence that I'm willing to accept for my freedom. I don't want to give that up. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, learn to think free. You know, yeah, you're right. And 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 this is a good country to learn to think free if you actually learn to think free. So yeah, well, yeah. If you can, right? If you can, that's right. See, so yeah, now that that freedom to understand what the scriptures say, especially about salvation, I think that's good for us. I'm I'm glad we had this discussion on it. Yeah. To see all of these break. Let me say break away from all of these controls and understandings that God is not trying to genocide the human race. He's trying to save the human race. Yeah. And exactly. it's through Christ that, hey, you can get an opportunity to stand in the state of grace, which is a condition with God through that relationship that's well beyond anything else in mm -hmm. the other relationship. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Well, hey, I enjoyed this. This was yep. a good one. And yeah, it worked uh, out good. Yeah, it did. And we'll we'll choose something from next week. Uh, okay. I guess during, during the week we can talk about what we want to talk about next week. But yeah, this is a good conversation. Enjoyed this. All right. I'll talk All to right. you later. All right. Talk to you. All right. All right bye bye. bye.